Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Grand Rapids Public Museum. Uh, I am Rob Skydema. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Grand Rapids Public Museum. And uh, I stand before you today wearing this t-shirt, which I was a little second guessing myself there for, for a minute, but I just want to say and point out I'm wearing this shirt on purpose, because today I am a proud museum person. And um, I wanted to share that because this afternoon is going to be uh, an incredible experience here with our guest lecturer. If you haven't had a, a chance yet to, to go just down the hallway to see the Overcoming Hateful Things exhibit, um, please do so. Um, but I'm just really proud to be a part of this institution and the collaborations um, that we have going on um, within the greater West Michigan community. Um, so bear with me for a couple of minutes as I kind of go through some logistic things and some background, um, and then I will introduce our, our guest speaker today. So I first want to start out by saying this is not how our, our stage typically looks, so you may have some curiosity um, about what's going on around you or behind me. Um, this is another partnership that I'm excited uh, to be involved with and, and really proud that we are hosting here at the museum. So this is in conjunction with the Ebony Road Players, which is a local theater group that focuses on the black experience um, through art, uh, performance arts, and visual art. And they reached out to us months ago about um, uh, partnering with them in celebrating Loving Day, um, which if you not, are, are not familiar with, that is the Loving versus Virginia Supreme Court case of 1967, um, brought by um, Mildred and Richard Loving, an interracial couple, um, to fight and strike down the, the laws that were, were um, banning interracial um, relationships. And that coincides uh, with celebrations throughout West Michigan here at the museum, but also other cultural institutions. So I encourage you, go to um, ebonyplayers.org, and you can learn more about all of the Loving Day celebrations. But this set in particular is for a play that will be debuting here in Grand Rapids called Alabama Story. And this looks at both that Loving Day um, decision, but also a controversial children's book called The Rabbit's Wedding um, that came out in 1958 that portrayed a white rabbit and a black rabbit having a relationship. And it was banned um, in Alabama, so the, the, the name of the book. And in conversations, unfortunately, the, the timing and the relevance just really struck home again, even here in 2023. Um, so we are very, very proud to be partnering with Ebony Road Players and the other cultural institutions that are, are participating in this. The play itself will be next Thursday through Sunday. And again, if you like tickets, please go to ebonyplayers.org and you can get your tickets through there. So they're in the middle, middle of the set build, um, which has been very, very cool. And, and the other uh, partnership that I'm extremely proud of is a, is a museum uh, employee here. And the, and the reason that you're here today is our partnership with the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Imagery at Ferris State University and their um, premiere of a traveling exhibit that they created called Overcoming Hateful Things. Stories from the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Imagery. And, and I want to thank um, Dr. David Pilgrim, who I'll talk a little bit more and introduce you to, um, Dr. Pink, president of Fair State University, our board members, um, and the community at large that really helped make this possible. Uh, the exhibit will be going on from now until September 3rd. Um, this is the first of a couple of opportunities that you're going to get to hear um, Dr. David Pilgrim speak about the exhibit, the museum, his, his life story, and the, the reason why um, he has pursued this. Um, we'll do another one again, a panel discussion August 13th with several members, including Dr. Pink, who is in the audience today. So mark your calendars for that as well. 
So uh, Dr. David Pilgrim is a professor at Ferris State University and the founder of the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Imagery. He's also an author, wrote the books Understanding Jim Crow and also Watermelons, Nooses, and Straight Razors. He's a lecturer in 2004. He and Clayton Rye produced the documentary Jim Crow's Museum to explain the approach in battling racism and that won several awards including Best Documentary in the 2004 Flint Film Festival. So please join me in a round of applause for Dr. David Pilgrim. Thank you very much. And before I get started, I want to have uh, President Pink say a few words. Uh, uh, we have this relationship with uh, with the Grand... I, I suppose I should have talked to you about that. Uh, uh, <laughs> with the Grand Rapids Public Museum, and uh, we're in the partnership business. And so I want to turn this over to my, to my president, my supervisor, and my brother. Thank you so much, Dr. Pilgrim. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Come on now, good afternoon. good afternoon. Anyone who has been at Fair State University for the past 11 months knows that when I say good morning, good evening, whatever, you gotta respond. You gotta let me know you're here. You gotta let me know you're present because being present in days like today is so important. On behalf of the university, I want to say not only welcome, but thank you for being a part of what is such a kickoff, not only to a traveling museum making its debut in Grand Rapids, but also a kickoff to many things to come in the future of the Jim Crow Museum at Ferris State University. As many of you know, um, we at the university are very focused, laser focused right now on a fundraising opportunity that we are now in the mode of raising funds to take the Jim Crow Museum that's there on the Ferris State campus. It's right now in the library on campus and to build its own facility. Um, and the location of that facility is really, really cool. It'll be right there at the entrance of the university when you're driving in it'll sit right there to the left of you as you're driving in the main entrance. And that whole thing, as we continue to go down, feel free to give money to that, by the way. Um, as we continue to go down that fundraising opportunity, what that means is that it will give our university this incredible opportunity to take a museum that is truly known worldwide. Did you hear that word? Worldwide. To take that museum and to set it in a space where Folks all over the globe will know where Big Rapids, Michigan is and know where Ferris State University is because that will be the home of an incredible story in the, in the presence of a museum. And so we look forward to that, but what you're gonna witness today when you go down the hallway to see the exhibit, you are witnessing what I would just call evolution. Because when you go to the museum there in, uh, in Big Rapids, if you've been there, you will see a really impressive collection of artifacts. What you will see down the hallway here is a very strong prelude, strong prelude to what will be in place when we get the new museum completed. Because when you see what's down the hallway and you see the presentation, but you see the story, because the exhibit itself tells a story. And Dr. Pilgrim is gonna talk about that today, of what this story of resilience truly is. But you'll hear him talk about that today. I wanna to personally thank Dale Robertson and all those here at the, uh, at the Grand Rapids Public Museum for an incredible partnership. Dale, we are indebted to the work that you do. We're indebted to this partnership. So thank you so much for that. And to all those of you who will help us out as docents over the next few months, thank you. And thank you for, if you're not gonna be a docent or if you're not Dale Robertson, thank you for spreading the word about what's in downtown Grand Rapids over this summer. Spread the word, tell people, tell them about coming down to the museum, tell them about this incredible display and the opportunity they can have to walk through and to witness this and tell them about this man. Tell them about this man because the dream, the vision that this man has had for decades as he will share with you today. That's part of the beauty of this museum getting completed is because it brings something that was a dream of decades to fruition. 
So a big thank you, and please once again welcome Dr. David Pilgrim. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Yeah. And people always say they don't want to follow me. That's, that's tough to follow that. So I was going to say thank you to the Grand Rapids Public Museum. I'll just say it tomorrow at the, at the other, other event. Uh, but to anyone from the Grand Rapids Public Museum that had anything to do with us being here, can you raise your hands, please? Yeah, give them a hand, if you would. And if you're from Ferris State University and are, if you helped on our end, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Give them a hand. Yeah. So I like our team, and I love, I love that they can tell me when I'm wrong. I don't like that they get so many opportunities. Uh, but we have the kind of team where people can, where, they, where, where, where their genius can show. And I'm looking at some of the people, and I'm trying not to call their names yet. So anyway, let me get started. Um, I don't know. How many of you have been to jail? Can I raise your hand? I'm just... That's your, don't always raise your hand. It's like Jesse Jackson walks around and he tells people to say stuff and they just say it. Like, man, I'm not saying that. Um, but I've been to jail. I'm not bragging or complaining, just stating a fact. Monroe, Louisiana. And I think the African American, I'll tell you a little thing about history is that in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, black Americans changed the jail experience, if that makes sense. It was a place of shame, and it became a place that was almost sacred. And so when you looked at, uh, 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 you know, Bloody Sunday and some of the events that occurred down in Alabama where people were arrested, when they would be sitting in jail, they'd be singing. They would be praising, right? You would have thought it was the island of Patmos. I mean, they were just... They were, they would get happy. Anybody know what getting happy means in church? They'd get happy in there, right? So I say that because Dr. King, when he was in Birmingham in jail, he wrote what is arguably this nation's best public letter. And it's called Letter from Birmingham Jail. And people take little excerpts out of that. And here's one that I think fits the work that we do in the Jim Crow Museum because he basically suggests that racial injustice is like a boil and that in order for us to deal with it, we have to lance it. We have to bring it out. And that's what the museum does, right? So that's a good backdrop for us. Next slide, please. So uh, just a little warning at the end. Now, I've taken out a lot of stuff in this presentation. Um, but there still are objects in, in, in this, or images in this presentation that you may find offensive. That is not our goal uh, at all. It's simply to show you what I'm talking about. But I want to say that on the front end. And actually, I noticed Frank, Frank works with the museum. Look at my face in the, uh, <laughs> that's like perfect. <laughs> so my own disgust, if you would. All right, next slide, please. So here's a couple things I want you to leave here with. Because when people don't know us, then they, they often come to wrong conclusions. Um, when we were located, when we built our current facility in 2012 in England at the London Telegraph, they did a survey asking their readership if the Jim Crow Museum should exist in Big Rapids, Michigan. And I'm like, Dude, are you serious? I mean, that's, that's actually kind of funny in a way, right? But then on the other hand, I was pleased at the results, which was 80% of the people said that we should exist. I think the percentages of people who not only think we should exist, but who appreciate, applaud, and then become champions of our work is in proportion to people that actually visit the museum where we're no longer just a concept, where we're a real thing and they can see the real work. So a lot of the people that have these apprehensions, they really don't know the work that we're doing. So our job is to tell them these points. Number one, we are educators. I don't want to ever lose sight of that. That's our job. We're all educators. And you can't be an educator without believing in the triumph of dialogue. 
right? So we're not these folks on on CNN and C-SPAN and Fox and all just yelling and screaming and whatever else for entertainment. We're actually trying to have productive, intelligent conversations about race, race relations, and racism. So we're educators. And as educators, we know these uh, th it works. It's not just an abstract concept for us. We know that taking these objects and having conversations around these objects, that it actually works. Number two, we display objects in their proper historical context. Every American that I meet, certainly every adult American that I meet, is a historian. And almost all of them are bad at it. You ask people, they start talking about the past in a minute. Oh, yeah, back in the 60s. I'm like, okay. They just, everybody has an idea about the past. We try really, really, really hard to get it right about the past. We're not afraid of the past. We want to understand it. Number three, and this is the big thing here. I was sitting in the museum one day, and I'm looking at all the ugliness that has been fostered on the African-American community. And I'm not a robot, right? I mean, things affect me. And I'm just thinking about it. And then it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I think this is what people mean when they say epiphany. It hit me that African-Americans have achieved great things in this nation despite all the stuff that's in that room. Despite all that stuff, because that stuff is the evidence of the prejudice, the discrimination. And so the real story is not whether or not this object should be in there or that object should be in there and, and the origins. Yeah, we tell the stories of the origins and their consequences. But the real story is about the resiliency of African-American people in this nation. So in the last part, I already mentioned about the triumph of dialogue. Next slide. So I bought my first piece when I was 11 or 12. I was growing up in the Deep South. You know, I'm a, I'm a multiracial person, although not the multiracial that most people think, but sub-Saharan, African, indigenous, and Venezuelan. And I always tell people, in Alabama, that makes you what? Black, right? That means you got to like Al Green and Kool-Aid, right? I mean, you got to like barbecue ribs. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Maybe you don't. Uh, you, you know, uh, uh, breakfast that's uh, fried catfish and grits and eggs and biscuits. And Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right, the rest of y'all just talk amongst yourselves because I'm, it, yeah, I mean, I grew up down there and I grew up at the end of Jim Crow and I was at a, um, Franklin did a really sneaky video of me in the, thing where he caught me on the day I was tired and not polished. And so I just started telling truths. And not that I don't tell them anyway, but they were a little truer than usual about my journey. And I talked about the day a little bit where I was at this carnival slash resort slash um, amusement park slash flea market, and someone was selling some objects, and I bought one and I broke it. And I haven't broken one since then, but that was my first piece. Oh, I haven't broken one on purpose, rather. Next slide. So I can't, I don't know who that handsome devil is, but I came to, that was some harsh laughter there. <laughs> I, I came to Ferris in 1990 and uh, didn't know Ferris's history. Um, didn't know about Woodbridge Nathan Ferris and his commitment to racial justice. Didn't know any of that. Um, quite frankly, no one else at Ferris did either at the time. But I came there and I was teaching sociology, intro to social, I met you guys, you came in there one day, John Thorpe brought you in there. And it was a little 500 foot square room. And it was just all visual storage, but it was good enough for me because it, it was a space where I could bring my students and my classroom was next door. And so I had stuff in there at one point, they were just on tables, like card tables. And um, it's, you know, this is a journey, right? And then eventually talk someone into giving us shelves and then donated my 3,200 pieces to the university under the condition that the university would, would preserve and display these objects even when I was dead. So I turned over my personal collection, which I had been collecting through my 20s and 30s. And my wife Peggy's here and can tell you about the times we argued because 
I ain't going in that nasty flea market. And then so she would be sitting in the car and then I'd be trying to go fast. Did I need to share that with everybody? <laughs> that, okay, I probably didn't need to share that with everybody. Next. Uh, next slide. So look at that room. I, how many of you watch Hoarders? Anybody watch the show Hoarders? Now, it's really kind of sad, I mean, um, but I am kind of a hoarder. And my approach, because I had such a small room, was I'm going to overwhelm people with the sheer volume because these objects were so pervasive. And so that little room, uh, and notice this too. I don't know how many of you are educators, um, but you can see there's teaching and learning going on in that picture. No matter what your pe pedagogy is, your teaching pedagogy is, uh, no matter what your style is in terms of teaching, you can see there's teaching. And here's the great part about it. Fair State University has a reputation for being eyes on, hands on in its teaching. But usually when we say that, Brother Pink, people are thinking welding or they're thinking printing technology or some of our other programs. But that's what's going on here. Eyes on, hands on, right? And you don't even see me in the picture. And my joke there is, is I don't think I was taking the picture because it's framed right. <laughs> Next slide. So the Jim Crow period, um, you know, I started calling my collection the Jim Crow collection at one point and then Jim Crow Museum later, the Jim Crow Learning Laboratory, all these things, because most of the objects I had uh, were created, uh, sold, and sold uh, from uh, the 1870s to the 1960s. Fortunately, though, I and then later others didn't stop with the 1960s, so we actually have objects that were created last year, for example. But during that period, these objects they, they both shaped and reflected. Listen to me when I say that. They shaped and reflected. Actually, I should probably say that the other way. They reflected attitudes toward African Americans, and then they shaped new ones, right? So if all you knew about African Americans was what you saw in these objects, would you want one living next door to you? Probably not. Would you vote for one for mayor? Probably not. Next slide. So here's our goal is is to get people to talk. And I hear people saying all the time, you know, talking is nothing. But they're talking when they say that. I mean, if you really don't think words matter, shut up. I know words matter. Because I've, I've been on the flip side of words of praise and encouragement, but I've also been on the other side, words that were meant to discourage and to tear down. Words do matter. The tongue matters, right? And so we believe in talk. Now, we also believe that ought to lead to systemic change in the country. Next slide. So here is a um, bumper uh, license plate. If we had more time and we didn't have this collection right next door, I'd do an exercise with you now, which is to ask you, what is it you see? When we do our work right in the museum, we're not proselytizing. We're not trying to turn folks into left wing, whatever. We're just trying to get people to think. And the best way is what we call visual thinking strategies. And that is to ask a person, what is it you see? Stole that from like elementary school students in art classes, where the teachers would just say to the, the little eight year old, what is it you see? What else do you see? We do that with our objects. And so right this, the, the, um, the black rat is supposed to be whom? Just scream it, Frank. Martin Luther King. And then the white rat is supposed to be whom? Yeah, so in the 1960s, there was a lot of talk about the new Negro and the new Democrat, where whoever made this license plate is basically saying the new Negro and the new Democrat, they're just rats, right? So here's the other part. A license plate is being used as propaganda. And it's an everyday object that would have been on somebody's car, right? So when I was young, I always thought propaganda was grainy old film and leaflets, right? I had a really narrow definition of what, a, what propaganda was. But then you start thinking, 
of the millions of everyday objects in this culture, which was used as propaganda to sustain the racial hierarchy. Next slide. And so this is a postcard. And, you know, postcards are great teaching tools because they're very visual. But here's the other thing, and I like to talk to young people about postcards, and what's the first thing you have to do when you want to use a postcard as a teaching tool for young people? Tell them what a postcard is because they don't even know what a postcard is. But I'm old enough. I'm in my late 30s, my very late 30s. <laughs> so I'm in my late 30s. Uh, and um, I remember going into drugstores and, uh, you know, dime stores, whatever we used to call them, five and, five and dime stores. And they would have those racks out front. And you would just turn the rack and you could put, pick the postcard. So it was an everyday object. And it wasn't being made by some extremist group, some domestic terrorist group. This is just mainstream American product. And it went through the mail system, right? And so on the back of a card, you get these really awful, awful racial sentiments. And a person's just sending it through the mail, an everyday object. Next slide. So what have we learned so far? Next slide. I started with this point, and, and I want to reemphasize it again. This is testimony. And I don't even take it farther than that. It's testimony to the resiliency of African Americans, and it's also testimony to the potential of American democracy and American egalitarianism. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, because, you know, when I think of President Reagan talking about the city upon the hill, I really believe we can get there. I, I Sometimes I believe it more than other times, but it's certainly something we can aspire to, right? So it's a testimony to the resiliency of, of African-Americans, but more broadly to this nation, that we can be better. I, here's a good example of how I know we can be better. If the Jim Crow Museum, as it's constantly as it is currently constituted, had existed 40 years ago, and people had walked through that museum, you would not see the disgust on their faces that you would see today. That disgust is evidence that we've made some progress. Isn't that a weird measure? You get my point? Yeah. Next slide. Another thing I've learned, when people come into the museum, they bring all their stuff with them, all their racial ideas. Most Americans don't think they're on a racial journey, and indeed, they don't even think of race as being an important part of their journey. But the fact of the matter is, we're all on, a, we're, we're on one big journey, but race, our ideas about race, our ideas about, our ideas about all these things matter in that journey. And so when a person comes into the museum, they already have certain attitudes about what it means to be white in America, what it means to be black in America, what it means to be multiracial in America. They already have some of these ideas. And that room, and this is one of the advantages we have in the Jim Crow Museum. When people come to us, they expect to talk about race and racism. And they expect to have their ideas challenged. So we have an advantage because people gird themselves up and they're ready for some of those discussions. Regrettably or not, most conversations about race in this country don't occur in an environment where people are expecting to have meaningful discussion. They occur at the baseball park or in the corridors or at work or whatever. And they're often done really, really poorly. Next slide. So here's one of the big lessons I learned this long time ago. Um, if you crush a person, you can't teach them after that. And you probably can't teach anyone who witnessed the crushing. And that is a hard lesson, especially for college professors. I haven't been in a classroom a long time, but most of my professorial colleagues would not allow a student to be right and them to be wrong. There's a level of maturity you have to have to let that happen. And, and especially if the person is wrong in a consensus way, right? So we all agree that person just being a, almost said a bad word, Bill, sorry. Whatever the word you think I was gonna say, just put it in there. So if the person is acting like that, you know, the tendency is to like, oh, no, I'm gonna put them in their place. 
well, you may get some cathartic release from that, but now you can't teach that person. That doesn't mean you don't push back. It doesn't mean we don't challenge. It doesn't mean we don't engage, but I don't need to crush you. I don't need to be right that way. I don't need that. Next slide. And here is the hardest lesson. These are these little, is there such thing as a little epiphany? All right, there is now. So here's a little epiphany. Because when I would travel the country at the end, people would raise their hands and say certain things. And one of the things they would say would be, why are we still talking about this? And even about this exhibit next door, which explains, if you go in there, it tells you why, it, why it's built. But folks are like, you know what they're really saying? They're really saying, I'm tired of talking about this. Or I'm uncomfortable talking about this. Or I find this to be a risky conversation that could go wrong. And so I don't want to do that. That's what they're really saying. That we have a kind of fatigue with the discussion or the dangers are just too much. And that's sad. I, I spoke at the University of Michigan, which for me is a big deal, because uh, I'm a proud graduate of The Ohio State University. <laughs> and so I put, hey, don't start me. Um, and so I put up some images on the board where it just says, what do you see? You know, that one, that, that one of the, some of those. And so here I had a room full of people, young, bright minds and all. And I said, so someone tell me what it is they see. No one would say a word. They were afraid to tell me what they saw for fear that someone would interpret that to mean that they were a bad person in some way. But it's hard to have a conversation if we can't say what we see. Does that make sense? We got to start with what I'm looking at. And then we can under, then we can get into like why I see what I see and is it really what I see and all that other stuff. But they were afraid to even say what they saw. This work, this work is never completed. And that is a hard, unhappy truth. Doesn't mean we can't make progress. Uh, we were in here the other night and I was telling a group well, the other day that the life of an activist, and I believe you can be a scholar and an activist, the life of an activist is the life of failure. That's what it is. It is failure, 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 small victory. Small victory. Failure, 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 failure. And it's one of the reasons when I was being groomed as a scholar activist at Ohio State, almost all my mentors had substance abuse problems because they've been banging their heads up against the walls trying to change this country for years. Did that get too deep too quickly there? Or that, okay, next slide. Let's get off the hard truth. So another thing people say, why can't we stop talking about race? If we stop talking about race, racism would go away. That doesn't even make what? Stupid sense. You know, the fact of the matter is we talk about race all the time. We just don't do it in places where ideas can be challenged. Next slide. I wish we never did find out where this image came from. We've been looking for it, but it's so symbolic, right? And this quote from George Santiano, which people often butcher, um, and, and you mix up the words, I think I have the right, the right quote there. I mean, there's a, it, it's, um, it's just an old saw now, like a, an adage that we don't, an axiom we don't even try to prove anymore. We just accept as truth that if you don't know the past, you're going to repeat it. I like this sentiment here, but here's the reality. There are people in this country who know the past, and they don't want to change it. They, they want to go back to some of that stuff. So it's not an absolute. Next slide. So I want to read this to you. It's not especially profound. It just comes out of my head. Americans like happy history, narratives that make us look smart, brave, and exceptional. We want a history that has been cherry-picked and ignores our mistreatment of the weak and disfavored, a history that can be celebrated at picnics, parades, and smug conversations. This approach to history is neither honest nor mature. So I don't want you to get it twisted. If you study the history of this country, 
you will find some things that were absolutely amazing. You will find things that will make you proud to be not just an American, but human. But you'll also find other stuff. Right? You'll find over 100,000 um, Americans of Japanese ancestry and Japanese and a few, 3,000 or so white Americans placed in internment camps. You'll find riots. In, the 19, in 1919, this country basically had a race riot, a race, a race war. You'll find indigenous people being mistreated, people with different ways of loving being mistreated. You will find a lot of that in this country. That's, that's the past. That's who we were, but we still live in a residue. Next slide. Oh, the goal of studying the past is to document what happened, not to make us feel good or bad. This is the most amazing thing. When, when I'm being interviewed by people that, um, you know, maybe have some questions about our approach, one of their biggest concerns is this is going to make people feel bad. Are you kidding me? You, like, if you look, I know some of you probably heard me say this before, like, History is a legitimate, should be a legitimate academic feel. It shouldn't make people feel good or bad. And my joke is, is that chemistry used to make me feel bad. <laughs> and what was the other one I felt bad? Um, Yiddish made me feel bad. Bob, you didn't even know I took Yiddish, did you? Oh, you did, I know. Um, Ritzpah. Hashemayim, right? I got Anachnu. Right? I got, I got like nothing more than that right now. Okay. For me, yeah. Okay. It's good. <laughs> All right. But I wasn't excelling in there and I felt bad. Now I'm being flippant here, but my point is this idea that the past and our interpretation of the past should make me feel good or bad as a person. That means it's getting caught up in other stuff. That's what it means. It's being caught up in jingoism, or it's being caught up in some really narrow definition of patriotism, or it's being caught up in something. It's not mature. We ain't going to be that city upon the top of the hill acting like that. We're just not going to. Next slide. So you saw that interest walking in, so I don't have to go over that much. I will tell you this, though. Uh, if you work with a designer, are we being taped? I want us to be taped because I want you to excerpt this piece and send it to them. Uh, we, we're not the kind of group at Ferris where we're going to give you a check and then we're going to show up a year and a half later and open the door and be surprised at what we see. That's not what we mean by building a museum, right? And so we're going to argue with you. We're going to debate with you. We're going to know why, it's, you know, no, no, no. These are the words we need. This is what we need and stuff. And so I'm, I'm really happy with the product that's next door, because it really was a collaborative effort, and it's still a collaborative effort. Next slide. So I'm not gonna leave this image up here long, but I just want to, to get you to see this quote. We studied the past because it happened and because we live in a residue. Next slide. And again, we are more democratic and more egalitarian as a nation than we were during the Jim Crow period. I personally believe we've taken some steps back the last half decade or decade or so. But in terms of the period that we mostly focus on, we're not that, we're not that place anymore. But we live in a residue. We live in a residue. Uh, one interesting thing, uh, how many of you know Burley Park? You guys go to Burley Park to... You know, it's like in Howard City or somewhere up in the way, wherever it is, right, off 131. So I go, they have flea markets and stuff or, um, on the holidays, uh, Memorial Day, 4th of July, all this stuff. And so I think it was last year I went out there and I saw this image right here, this one right here. And it was such an interesting experience because I have, I have purchased, I have purchased worse things than that in an objective and a subjective sense. But I could not give that guy to Sarah, you hear me? I could not give him $20 for that sign. I just couldn't make myself do it. Now, you're talking to a person who's bought lynching images and who's bought really hate. But on that day, I just said, you know what? I'm not giving this guy money for that. I just, I'm, I can't do it. And, there, of course, in my own journey, there's lots of stories where, especially when I was a young man, 
I, I remember being in Colorado Springs and uh, Mayor Mernick, John Thorpe, and somebody else, we were out there. And I went into an antique store and the guy had some, the 78s, you know, the big records. And, and they didn't have horrible images, they had no images, but the titles of the songs were just so awful. And the person said to me, because he saw the look on me, he said, I don't know what you're, what you're getting upset about. It's your people's history. Now, first of all, that's silly. It's the nation's history. And it's a distortion of my people. But instead of a rational response like that, all of a sudden I want to talk to him about, like, non-productive things. And I wanted to express to him in a rather dramatic way my displeasure with these objects. <laughs> so what I ended up getting was the argument and not the, not the object. And so, you know, again, if you're going to collect this stuff, it's going to, it's going to do stuff to you. Next slide. So again, we have, we have progress, but we live in a residue. This is what I always say about uh, polit polit politicians and their depictions, and in this case, President Obama. In, in our museum, we have him presented in all the ways, or many of the ways, that African Americans were caricatured during the Jim Crow period. So witch doctors, and I mean, just name, you know, Uncle Tom, all these different portrayals of President Obama. And my response to that is this, shouldn't it just be sufficient to disagree with the person's politics? I don't have to make them the devil. I don't have to make them a Sambo. I don't have to make them a Tom. I don't have to do all that stuff. I can just disagree with them. That's what I can do. Next slide. Or agree with them. Next slide. So we've had a lot of racial um, uh, or justice movements in this country. When a lot of times people think of a civil rights movement, they only think of the 50s and the 60s, but we've had civil rights movements of various iterations throughout this country's past, right? And so when we look at the most recent racial or justice movement in this country, um, it, it followed the death of or the killing of George Floyd. And actually, if you look up at the top, See, that's us living in the residue. Next slide. So I, I like to put this up here. You know, I grew up in Alabama. Um, you know, Dr. King, you, you know, if you grew up in a black community like I did, especially a southern black community, they say bad stuff about everybody. I mean, I'm not just talking about the barbershop. I mean, people just tell you what they think. And so I would say most people really, really liked Dr. King. But there were people that liked Malcolm X, and there were people that thought both of them were troublemakers, right? This is all in the African-American community. But I would say Dr. King was the most revered of all the folks when I grew up. And I grew up thinking that if he said something, it was probably true. And I remember one time reading this, this is an excerpt, it says, the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice. And I think that got in my subconscious. And this is what I mean. I spent my entire life thinking we were always moving toward a better future. And that even though the progress was sometimes so imperceptible that you didn't even notice it, but that, but that it was all bent toward what? A just society. We were gonna get there, right? And I carried that with me up until, like I said, about a decade ago, when I started hearing racial rhetoric that I had heard when I was a child growing up in Alabama and George Wallace was the, president, uh, was the governor. And I thought I would never hear that stuff again. And I started in, in, in politicians, including the White House, but also in lo lower levels, people saying the stuff that they had been just keeping to themselves saying it out loud again, saying it out loud again, and then justifying saying it out loud. Well, we can say it because they say it. And then I had this moment, I'm like, are we really bent toward justice? Is it inevitable? No, it's not inevitable. We own the future. If we're alive, we own it. We shape it. Dr. King used to talk about time and because people would say, why don't you wait 
Things will get better if you just wait. Time will heal everything. You've heard that kind of stuff, right? Time, just give it time. And his point about time was this. Time is neutral. It's what we do with the time. If we do evil things with the time, we get an evil outcome. If we do, I sound like a Quaker now. If we're doing great things with the time, loving brotherhood things with the time, that's the future we're working to create. Next slide. I actually tried to find a Quaker place because I thought, I can, I want to see, I want to go, right? And, and, and I didn't know enough. My ignorance was astounding. I thought they had a church and it, they meet in people's homes so you, and communities and stuff, right? So if anybody in here um, can tell me where to go, because I like going to different, different groups and where? They have a, okay, well, that's good. See, it was worth my while coming here today. Have a place to go to worship, okay? All right, so we at the museum, we, we in our current place don't focus so much on the civil rights movement. It's a part of the story, but not as big a part of the story as we're going to tell. And one of the reasons we're going to expand our civil rights uh, material, uh, our, our storytelling is because we received 372 photographs from Bruce Davison, who was a young, I think about 28 years old, Jewish kid on the Freedom Ride buses. And so we have his photographs. We have a lot of those photographs. So we can tell that story, right? And that's going to be great. But I put it up here because uh, I had someone write me one time. He was a, a white, his, uh, uh, dis he said he was white, said he was working on his dissertation, and he wanted to know as a white person, does he have the right to study race in our country? And I thought, how sad that is, that he doesn't feel empowered to just do good research, right? And here's the thing, the past belongs to all of us. Just do it right. Are you listening to me? Just do it right. And for all the folks like, we don't want black history. We don't want to. Okay, then do it right. And we don't have to do that. Just do it right. Do it with care. Next slide. So if I then, if I did, then I think I left a word out. All right, anyway, this is what I, I need to do better. That's so confused, I almost fell down. Next slide. So here's a couple points before I wrap up here. If you're woke until your privilege is challenged, you're still asleep. And Dr. Pink, uh, close your ears for one second here. I'm, is, so I tell people when they talk about being woke, I've been woke since the doctor slapped my ass. And if you remember the old days where they used to hit the baby, that's really funny. I don't care. This group is tough. That's, that's a funny line right there. That's all over the Internet, by the way, too. Yeah, so... The first part of being awake and aware is just looking at myself and recognizing where, my, where, where are the spots where I can't see. Where are the groups? And I know there's parts of me that, that, um, that I just need to be better. I don't need to crush myself, but I need to be better. Next slide. Be quiet. And again, if you're an educator, this is one of our challenges. Because we used to we used to talking and telling people stuff, but sometimes you just listen. You don't have to believe what the person is saying. You don't have to accept what they're you know. You don't have to change your whole welt and chung, right? Your whole worldview. You don't have to do any of that, but you can listen. So I started collecting objects that defame and mock women about ten or fifteen years ago. Collected like a couple thousand. I've turned that work over to some other colleagues, and one of the first things I noticed was, man. I need to shut up and just listen. I did not know this. I did not know this. I did not know this. I can't believe what I did not know. Next slide. So this is me kissing the sky. Anybody know who that is? That's probably how he looked to himself, uh, given his art. Okay, I'll leave it alone. All right, next slide. So this is the new museum we're building. Isn't that amazing? 
Yeah, give it a hand clap if you don't mind. Yeah. Can you imagine coming up to Big Rapids, Michigan, and coming into our campus and that being the first building you see? It's beautiful. Next slide. So these are just some of the early images in there. And actually, if you want a, a pretty good idea of what it's going to feel like and look like, the exhibit is a taste of that, right? Next slide. Next slide. And again, with the pushback. And I, I have to be honest about something for purposes of transparency. I wasn't always supportive of the pushback idea. And about 15 years ago, John Thorpe and I went to Encore, and I gave this presentation where I just showed all these horrible objects and, what they, and told the story of what they were and what their consequences were and how they damaged the nation, it damaged the democracy, and it damaged individuals. And then I finished, and then someone raised their hand. I'll never forget this. We had to get this story from John. When, when um, they raised their hand and they said, so aren't you going to tell the story of black people fighting back? And I was like, this is, see, um, I was like, I got defensive, I think. And I said, no, we already have African-American history museums. Not enough of them, but we got them. And we have African-American achievement spaces. Not enough of them, but we have some. What America doesn't have is a museum that focuses on race, race relations, and racism. And that's what we want to do. And I was wrong. I was just flat out wrong. And I've gotten righter over the years. Yeah. Next slide. So one of the things we're going to do, too, and this is, I was telling you this, we're going to uh, have a lot of folks up there that you don't see in the February calendars. People including from West Michigan. We went to the Giants dinner. Um, I don't know when that was, Bill. It was recently. And they have a brochure in there. And they were telling the story of, like, the first African-American woman who was a school teacher here. I'm putting her, if I don't do nothing else before I die, she's going to be on a wall in that museum. And I think of other folks who've done amazing things in Michigan. And again, we can do that now. We'll have the facility to do that, to tell those stories. We are more than the eight folks that are offered up to us. And they should be offered up. They did great things, but there are lots of other people. Next slide. And... Another story we're going to tell, which I think actually you could see once they get it. Next slide, please. Yeah. So we're going to tell the story of how you make this world better. And by that, I mean the guy in my mirror, my neighborhood, my city, my state, and my nation and the world. We're going to focus on people who spent their lives trying to create just society. And we're going to try to learn from them. And we already have police departments and politicians and civil rights groups and human rights groups and church groups and every other group coming. But more are going to come. And we're going to have those discussions. Because when people, when you leave that exhibit, one of the first things you think is, what now? What can I do? And we want to be a part of that answer. Next slide. Next slide. I, I could tell you a story, and I'm not going to do it. Next slide. Next slide. I, don't you love that campaign, We Are Not Jim Crow? We're going to do that. That's going to be a national campaign. Dale, you want to be a part of that? You're going to have to, you're going to, have to put up some money, because you, <laughs> you can't just say, I want to be a part of that. You know? I, oh, no, I'm not talking about your wallet. Your wallet's not going to help us, Dale. All right? Yeah, we are not Jim Crow, right? We're not caricatures. You know, I'm not a Tom. I'm not a Coon. I'm not a Sambo. I'm not a Piccaninny. I'm a child of God. That's what I am. In his splendor. But I'm certainly not Jim Crow. Next slide. So y'all know who that is uh, in that picture? 
Yeah, that's me. No, no, I mean the other person. That's Lupe. And so um, I, I think this is the last slide. And uh, young visitors to the museum asked me, and by young visitors, I think it's happened once. What was it like to live during the civil rights struggle? And I gently tell them that we are living during the civil rights struggle. Next slide. So that's it. Thank you very much. So during the Jim Crow era and before, it was before access, there were reading laws that mm -hmm. stopped African Americans from reading. Oh. So what effect do you think that those laws back then mm -hmm. still have on African American readers today? Because I'm a teacher, I teach ELA, mm -hmm. and I'm also a reading interventionist, mm -hmm. and that's just a question that I'm going to pose for my papers. Okay. So there's a couple ways to, to answer that, and I often find myself I often find myself caught between the, the polarized views in America. So I'll show you what I mean by that. On the one hand, there's this group that believes that African Americans and every other Americans are 100% responsible for everything that happens to them. And then these are extremes, right? And then the other side is that it's the society and the state which is 100% responsible for answering every question. So my thing is, to get to your question, during the Jim Crow period, uh, it would have been before the Jim Crow period when African Americans weren't allowed uh, to read. Uh, however, during the period, and let me be clear about that, during enslavement, there, there were laws, right, that, that said African Americans couldn't read in some places. Uh, but African Americans did, did find ways, you know, seek, well, there's a whole lot of material, secret schools and all of that. During the Jim Crow period, the challenge was different. The challenge was, um, you know, schools that were not properly financed, you know, schools that were uh, just horrible in terms of the, the conditions of them, uh, the, the health conditions, the, the reading materials were, were second or third or fourth hand. Uh, so, the, the, you know, not enough money allocated to, to, to those schools. So that was more the problem there. But even then, there were African Americans who excelled, you know, in terms of being scholars and the like. And so part of my answer to you is, is that even though we still have some systemic privileges given to some parts of cities versus others, that as long as there are public libraries in this country, no one can keep you ignorant. All right? That's the way I was taught, right? If I, now, I was in Mobile and we couldn't, Pritchard, we couldn't go to the Pritchard Library uh, until I was uh, ninth grade, I think. But as long as there are books to read, you know, you can keep me, it was a quote I have, you can keep me out of Harvard, but you can't keep me ignorant, right? So that's, that's what I mean. So it's like a, it's, I'm giving you answers like a both kind of things. So what I tell young people is, or what I hope to show young people, are the many African Americans who were in much worse circumstances than we're in who just excelled, who just flat out excelled. And I don't want to hear anything about how learning is, you know, or being smart is a part of another culture. It means you're not authentically a part of this culture. That's self-hatred. That society has taught folks to think like that. So that's a long, weird answer, but that's my answer. Yeah, so, and well, I'm gonna give you the other part of this. When I walked across the stage at, at Ohio State, Actually, I mean that symbolically walk across stage because I didn't walk across the stage. My degree should be accepted both for my hard work, right? I wrote the dissertation, I did all stuff, but also for the many people who sacrificed so that I could get into Ohio State in the first place. And it doesn't diminish my accomplishment at all. It's not a burden to me to acknowledge the folks who marched and protested and saved. You know, I wouldn't have even gone to college. I didn't have the money to go to college, even though I had, um, you know, I, I had, once I could get there, I could go. But I mean, I didn't have the money to get from Pritchard, Mobile, Alabama to Texas, you know, when I, where I went to undergrad. And uh, Miss Ellis, I heard the story, I apologize. 
Miss Ellis went into her kitchen because she just sensed that there was something wrong. I wasn't excited about going away. And she went into an old Sanka can, Sanka, the coffee. This is a black folks bank bill. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, went in the kitchen, came back with $75, which is about $400 in today's money, and gave it to me so that I would have the bus ride to go to Jarvis Christian College, which is where I started my education. That's what I'm talking, that's what I can do for young folks, right, is to tell them those stories, right? So she helped me. And then now I'm supposed to be helping other folks. All right, we got time for one more of the long convoluted answers I have. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Well, the the uh, I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully now because what I wanted to say was I went to bed one night. It was 2017 Michigan, and I woke up, and it was 1963 Alabama. Um, and so, you know, there has to be a part of our nation that still believes in education. That 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 can depoliticize knowledge at least as much as as you can that can deracialize knowledge at least as much as you can and i think that the people that come into a display like ours they will be challenged to to hold that view but to your question there're some people that are not ready for that conversation and that's okay that's okay they're not ready for that conversation uh, and, and let me put it this way. They're not ready yet. You know? So it's not a failure because they're not ready to yet have the conversation. You know, um, that is the most unsatisfying answer I have ever given <laughs> to a question. All right. So I will end it with that. And uh, uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation next door. Thank you again for coming out and joining us. Thank you, Dr. Pilgrim, for your your great talk, um, partnering with us. Come back out and see us in August. And oh, by the way, if you had uh, questions about the Ebony Road players, it's ebonyroad.org. And the great Edie Hyde is in the back of the auditorium. If you have more questions, she would be more than willing to answer uh, any of those. Enjoy the rest of your day.